Section zero of the Shakespeare Storybook. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Jason in Panama. The Shakespeare Storybook by Mary MacLeod. Introduction. Literary critics have many times during the past two thousand years waged battle with one another over the question whether drama owes its excellence chiefly to plot or chiefly to character. Is it the business of the dramatist, critics ask successively through the ages, to inspire the playgoer with a deeper interest in the external circumstances which would mould the fortune of his heroes and heroines than in their individual temperaments and the inner workings of their minds and hearts? But critics commonly counted a bondage to fix a belief, and after clothing their question in the complexity of disquisition, they rarely stay for a clear and decisive answer. The glimmering light of dialects usually involves in shadow one or the other commanding phase of the problem. To the plain observer it would seem that both plot and character are essential constituents of perfect drama, that the strength of the one depends on the strength of the other, and that, except to the questioning critic, it is a matter of small practical consequence to which the greater importance be attached by the refinements of theory. In the best plays of Shakespeare the interest evoked respectively by plot and character is so evenly balanced that he must be exceptionally short-sighted who would set the value of the one above the value of the other. The external circumstances that mould the fortunes of Hamlet, Macbeth, Lear, Othello, rivet the playgoers and the reader's attention in no less a degree than the individual temperaments of these great dramatic personages or the inner workings of their minds and hearts. It is the perfectly harmonious cooperation of plot and character that is responsible for Shakespeare's noblest triumphs. Close and constant study of the great plays of Shakespeare must ultimately rouse in the student a more absorbing interest in their characters than in their plots. That is the final effect of supreme dramatic genius. But the full appreciation of Shakespeare's sure and illimitable insight into character can never be reached until we have made ourselves thoroughly familiar with the plot in which the character has its substantive being. It follows, therefore, that if one would realize completely in due time the whole eminence of Shakespeare's dramatic achievement, one should be encouraged at the outset to study closely the stories of the plays rather than the characters apart from their settings. When the youthful mind has grasped the manner and matter of the plots, it will in adult age be in a far better position than it could be otherwise to comprehend all the excellences, all the subtleties of the characters. Only when plot and character have received equally full attention will Shakespeare stand revealed to the mature student in his manifold glory. It was this point of view that led Charles Lamb and his sister Mary to prepare their Tales from Shakespeare designed for the use of young persons. Their volume was first published in 1807. The two writers narrated, in simple language for the most part, the plots of twenty of Shakespeare's plays, fourteen comedies and six tragedies. None of the historical dramas, whether English or Roman, were included, nor was a place found for the comedies of Love's Labour's Lost and The Merry Wives of Windsor, nor for the tragedies of Troilus and Cressida and Titus Andronicus. The greater part of the volume was the work of Mary Lamb. Although Charles Lamb's name alone appeared upon the title page, he was responsible for no more than six of the tales, those of the six tragedies. Mary Lamb had little of her brother's literary power, she was in sympathy with his literary tastes she had something of his shrewdness of judgment but she had none of his wealth of fancy his pliancy of style his humorous insight or his learning although mary lamb's renderings of the plots of the comedies have the charm of matter-of-fact simplicity they cannot be held on a close scrutiny to satisfy all the needs of the situation they often trace the course of the stories too faintly and imperfectly to recall Shakespeare's own image. 
frequently in mary lamb's work pertinent intricacies of plot are blurred by a silent omission of details knowledge of which is essential to a complete understanding of the shakespearean theme for example the story of the caskets is excluded altogether from mary lamb's version of the plot of the merchant of venice of bottom and his allies in midsummer night's dream she has nothing to tell titiana falls in love with a nameless sleeping clown who had lost his way in the wood and when in mary lamb's version the ass's head which puck sets on the clown's neck is removed he is left to finish his nap with his own fool's head upon his shoulders nothing is more vouchsafed about the rude mechanicals of theseus's athens mary lamb's rendering of as you like it admits no mention of the melancholy jacques of the shrewdly witty touchstone or of the rustic audrey the ludicrously self-centred malvolio and his comically tragic self-deception disappear from her version of twelfth night elsewhere in the comedies and even in charles lamb's own work on the tragedies shakespeare's text is at times misinterpreted consequently however fascinating in themselves the narratives of the lambs may prove to young readers lamb's tales offer them a very fragmentary knowledge of the scope of shakespeare's plots an endeavour to supply young readers with a fuller and more accurate account of them is therefore well justified and this endeavour is made in the present volume in studying the stories on which shakespeare based his plays it is always worth bearing in mind that he cannot be credited with the whole invention of any of them except in the case of one play the comedy of love's labours lost in accordance with the custom of all dramatists of the day it was his practice to seek the main lines of his plots in prose fictions or in historical chronicles by other hands romantic fiction was born for modern europe on italian soil boccaccio of fourteenth-century florence and boccaccio's long line of disciples bandello of milan giraldi cinthio of ferrara and many writers of less familiar name of the sixteenth century had for generation before shakespeare's epoch furnished not only italy but all the western countries of europe with their chief recreative literature in prose the italian novels were through the second half of the sixteenth century constantly translated into english and french and it was to those english or french translations of the italian romances that shakespeare owed the main suggestion for all the plots of his comedies save love's labours lost and for many of those of his tragedies belleforest's histoires tragiques a collection of french versions of the italian stories of bandello was very often in his hands novels by bandello are the ultimate sources of the stories of romeo and juliet of much ado about nothing and of twelfth night all's well that ends well and cymbeline largely rest on foundations laid by boccaccio the tales of othello and measure for measure are traceable to giraldi cinthio but although shakespeare's borrowings from the frank and vivacious fiction of sunny italy were large and open-handed his debt was greater in appearance than it was in reality he freely altered and adapted the borrowed stories in accordance with his sense of dramatic and artistic fitness so that the finished plays present them in shapes which bear little relation to their original forms at times he intertwined one borrowed story with a second and his marvellous ingenuity completely changed the aspect of both each assumed new and unexpected point and consistency with such effect did he combine in the merchant of venice the story of the caskets with the story of shylock's bond with antonio his capacity of assimilating all that he read was as omnipotent as his power of assimilating all that passed in life within range of his eye or ear the stories that he drew from books on which to found his plays can only be likened to base ore which the magic of his genius had the faculty of transmuting into gold but for young readers who approach shakespeare's work for the first time through the present narration of the stories of his plays it is not necessary to learn whence shakespeare derived their bare lineaments or how he breathed into them the glowing spirit of life 
It is essential that young readers should find delight and recreation in the tales as he finally presented them in his plays. Such delight and recreation, I believe, the contents of this volume is fitted to afford them. It only remains to express the wish that the knowledge here conveyed to young readers of Shakespeare's plots may lead them to become in future years loving students of the text of his plays. The words employed by Charles Lamb in a like connection when he first sent into the world his and his sister's tales from Shakespeare may fitly be echoed here. Young men and women cannot learn too early in life how the study of Shakespeare's work may, in a far higher degree than the study of other literature, enrich their fancy, strengthen them in virtue, withdraw them from selfish and mercenary thoughts. Life will bring them no better instructor in the doing of sweet and honorable action, no better teacher of courtesy, benignity, generosity, humanity. For of both stories and characters proffering the counsel to seek what is good and true, and to shun what is bad and false, Shakespeare's pages are full. Sidney Lee End of Section Zero Section One of the Shakespeare Storybook This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Craig Franklin The Shakespeare Storybook by Mary MacLeod The Tempest, Part One, The Magician's Isle There was once a lonely island far away in the midst of a wide sea. Only four beings lived on this island. An elderly man called Prospero, noble, grave and learned, his daughter, Miranda, and two attendants. One of these attendants was a beautiful and dainty spirit called Ariel, the other a sullen monster called Caliban. For Prospero had more than worldly learning, he knew the art of magic, and by his mighty spells he could control not only the spirits of light and darkness, but also the forces of nature. No travellers ever came to the island, and since the day when Miranda had been brought thither, a little baby girl, she had never seen the face of any man except her father. Peacefully, the years slipped by, and Miranda had grown into a beautiful young maiden, when one day a terrible storm of thunder and lightning burst over the island. In the midst of this tempest, a noble vessel seemed to be sinking, and Miranda ran to entreat her father that, if by his magic arts he had put the waves into such an uproar, he would now allay them. "'Be comforted, dear child, there is no harm done,' said her father. "'What I have done is only in care for you, and I have so safely ordered this wreck that not a hair of any one on board shall suffer hurt. Until now we have lived peacefully in this little spot, and you know nothing of what you are, nor that I am anything more than Prospero, the master of a poor enough cell, and your father. It never entered into my thoughts to inquire further, said Miranda. The time has come when you must know everything, said Prospero, and laying aside his magic mantle, he bade his daughter sit down beside him, and then he told her the story of their life. "'Can you remember a time before we came to this island?' he began. "'I do not think you can, for you were then only a few years old.' "'Certainly I can,' replied Miranda. "'It is far off, and more like a dream than a remembrance. Had I not four or five women once that waited on me?' "'You had, Miranda, and more.' Twelve years ago your father was the Duke of Milan, and a Prince of Power. Oh, heaven! What foul play had we that we came from thence? Or was it a blessing that we did? Both, both, my girl, by foul play, as you say, were we driven from Milan, but blessedly helped thither. In those days Milan was the first state in Italy, and everywhere renowned for its splendour. I had so great a love for art and learning that I devoted much of my time to study, and left the government of the state to my brother, Antonio, 
whom I loved best in the world, and trusted beyond measure. But he was false to the confidence reposed in him, and soon began to think that he was duke in reality. He therefore entered into a plot with an inveterate enemy of mine, Alonso, king of Naples, and by promise of a large bribe obtained his assistance. A treacherous army was levied, and one midnight Antonio opened the gates of Milan to the king of Naples. In the dead of darkness, you and I were seized and hurried away. So great was the love borne me by my people that the traitors dared not kill us. But we were cast adrift in a rotten boat, without sail, mast, or tackle. By the kindness of a noble Neapolitan, Gonzalo, rich stuffs, foods, and necessaries had been placed in the boat, together with many valuable books from my library, which I prize more than my dukedom. The waves bore us to this island, and here we have lived ever since, and I have given such care to your teachings that you know more than many other princesses, with more leisure time and less careful tutors. "'Heaven thank you for it, dear father,' said Miranda. "'And now I pray you, tell me your reason for raising this storm.' By his magic art, Prospero replied, he knew that by chance his enemies had come near the island, and unless he seized this happy moment his fortunes would droop never to recover. "'But ask no more questions, Miranda,' he ended. "'You are weary. Rest here, and sleep a little.' As soon as Miranda was asleep, Prospero summoned his dainty and nimble little sprite Ariel, and asked whether he had performed his bidding. "'In every particular,' replied Ariel, and he told his master how, in the guise of a flame, he had danced all over the storm-driven ship till the whole vessel seemed on fire, and every one on board, except the mariners, had plunged affrighted into the sea. "'But are they safe, Ariel?' not a hair perished not a thread of their garments hurt i have scattered them in troops about the island as you bade me the king of naples son ferdinand i have landed by himself and now he is sitting and sighing alone in an odd corner of the isle and the king's ship safely in harbour hidden in a deep nook the mariners already weary with their labour i have charmed away to sleep the rest of the fleet, which I scattered, have now all met again, and are in the Mediterranean, bound safely home for Naples. They believe that they have seen the king's ship wrecked, and that all on board have perished. Prospero was much pleased with the way Ariel had performed his charge. But he said there was still some further work to do. He promised that if all went well, Ariel, in two days, should be set free from service, and henceforward should be his own master. He bade Ariel now take a new shape, that of a nymph of the sea, invisible to all but his own master. In this guise, Ariel approached the young prince of Naples, and began to sing in the sweetest fashion. Full fathoms five thy father lies, O oh, his bones a coral made, Those are pearls that were his eyes, Nothing of him that doth fade, but to suffer a sea change into something rich and strange sea nymphs howly ring his knell hark now i hear them ding dong bell lured by the sound of this sweet singing which came he knew not whence Fernand followed the unseen ariel into the presence of prospero and miranda now except her father miranda had never seen a man and at first she did not know what Ferdinand was. "'Is it a spirit, father?' she asked. "'No, child. It eats and sleeps, and has the same senses that we have. This gallant whom you see was in the wreck, and except that his handsome face is somewhat worn with grief and trouble, you might call him a goodly person. He has lost his companions, and wanders about to find them.' "'I might call him a thing divine.' replied Miranda warmly, for I never saw anything so noble. Ferdinand, in his turn, was equally enchanted with the sight of Miranda, and declared on the spot that, if there were no one else whom she already loved, he would make her Queen of Naples. Prospero was delighted 
with the way matters were going for it was his desire that the young people should love each other but fearing that a prize so easily won would be held too light he began to throw some difficulties in the way he pretended to believe that ferdinand was not really a king's son and had come to the island as a spy he declared he would put him into fetters and give him only the coarsest food to eat in vain miranda implored her father to treat the young prince less harshly prospero told her to be silent and roughly bade ferdinand to follow him the prince was naturally indignant at such uncourteous treatment and hastily drew his sword in defence but prospero threw a sudden spell over the young man and he stood motionless unable to stir what put thy sword up traitor commanded prospero sternly and ferdinand feeling himself powerless to resist and happy that in his prison he should at least have the pleasure of beholding the beautiful maiden who had so kindly pleaded for him followed obediently when the magician again summoned him end of section one section two of the shakespeare story book this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org the shipwrecked wanderers meanwhile the rest of the royal party who had plunged into the sea from the king's ship was wandering in another part of the island among them were alonso king of naples and his brother sebastian the shipwrecked wanderers meanwhile the rest of the royal party who had plunged into the sea from the king's ship was wandering in another part of the island among them were alonso king of naples and his brother sebastian antonio the usurping duke of milan gonzalo an honest old counsellor of the king of naples with adrian and francisco two of his lords exhausted with the labour they had undergone the whole party with the exception of sebastian and antonio presently fell asleep antonio not content with having driven his own brother from the dukedom of milan now began to suggest treachery to sebastian the brother of the king of naples ferdinand the son of the king of naples he said must certainly have been drowned his only daughter clarabel was married and far away in africa in fact they were at this moment on their way home from her wedding festivities there was therefore no near heir to the throne of naples antonio suggested that sebastian should seize the kingdom of naples as he himself had usurped that of milan he pointed out how easy it would be to slay king alonso as he lay there asleep in fact he offered to do the deed himself while sebastian at the same moment was to put an end to the faithful gonzalo the other lords would offer no resistance but would willingly agree to any suggestions made to them sebastian was only too ready to fall in with this wicked scheme but in the meanwhile invisible to them ariel came near and at the very moment when the traitors had drawn their swords and were about to kill alonso and gonzalo he sang in the ear of the latter and awakened him good angel save the king cried gonzalo and alonso started awake at the shout why how now how awake cried the king why are your swords drawn why do you look so ghastly what's the matter asked gonzalo still dazed with sleep while we stood here guarding your repose just now said sebastian with a ready lie we heard a hollow burst of bellow like bulls or, or other lions did it not wake you it struck my ear most terribly i heard nothing said the king oh it was did enough to frighten a monster to make an earthquake said antonio surely it was the roar of a whole herd of lions did you hear this gonzalo asked the king upon mine honour sir i heard a humming and then a strange one too which wakened me i shook you sir and cried out as my eyes opened i saw their weapons there certainly was a noise we had better stand on guard or leave this place let us draw our weapons 
"'Lead away from here,' commanded the king. "'Let us make further search for my poor son.' "'Heaven keep him from these beasts,' said Gonzalo, "'for he is surely in the island.' "'Lead away,' repeated Alonso. "'Prospero shall know what I have done,' said Ariel, "'as Alonso and his companions started again on their wanderings. "'Go, king, go safely on to seek thy son.' THE KING'S SON Prospero, in order to carry out his plans, pretended to be very harsh and severe with the young prince of Naples, and he set him a heavy task, to remove and pile up some thousands of logs. For the sake of the love he already bore to Miranda, Ferdinand obeyed patiently, and it sweetened and refreshed his labour to see how distressed the gentle maiden was at the sight of his toil. "'Alas, I pray you, do not work so hard,' entreated Miranda, as she met him, bearing a log. "'I would the lightning had burnt up all these logs. Pray set that down, and rest you. My father is hard at study. Pray now, rest yourself. He is safe for the next three hours.' "'Oh, most dear lady,' said Ferdinand, "'the sun will set before I can finish what I must strive to do.' "'If you will sit down,' said Miranda, "'I will carry your logs the while. Pray give me that.' I will carry it to the pile. No, dear lady, I had rather crack my sinews, break my back, than that you should undergo such dishonour while I sit lazy by. It would become me as well as it does you, said Miranda, and I would do it the more easily, because I want to do it, and you do not. You look weary. No, noble lady, when you are near me, the night becomes fresh morning, said Ferdinand. I do beseech you, chiefly that I may set it in my prayers. What is your name? Miranda. Admired Miranda. Dearest name in the world, cried Ferdinand. Many gentle ladies I have been pleased to see and to talk with, and I have liked different women for different virtues. But never until now have I found one without some defect. But you, oh you, so perfect and so peerless, are created the best of every creature. "'I do not know any of the women,' said Miranda simply. "'I remember no woman's face save from my glass mine own. "'Nor have I seen others that I may call men, "'except you, good friend, and my dear father. "'I do not know what they may be like, "'but in simple truth, "'I would not wish any companion in the world but you, "'nor can I imagine anyone whose look I would like better. "'But I prattle too wildly, and in that forget my father's precepts. In rank, I am a prince, Miranda, said Ferdinand. I I think a king. Would it were not so? For he thought his father had perished with the ship. I would not for one moment endure the slavery if it were not for you. The very instant I saw you, my heart flew to your service, and for your sake I carried these logs patiently. Do you love me? By heaven and earth, I love, prize, and honour you beyond all limit of everything else in the world. Miranda's eyes filled with tears of joy. I am foolish to weep for what I am glad of, she whispered. Why do you weep, said Ferdinand? Because I am unworthy to offer the love I desire to give, said Miranda, much less to take what I shall die for if I do not have. I am your wife if you will marry me. If not, I'll die a maid. You may refuse to have me as your companion, but I'll be your servant whether you will or no. My queen, dearest, and I thus humble ever, said Ferdinand, kneeling before her. My husband, then? Aye, with a heart as willing as freedom after bondage, here's my hand. And mine, with my heart in it. And now, till half an hour hence, farewell. A thousand, thousand, cried Ferdinand. And so they parted. Unseen by the young lovers, Prospero, in his cell, had listened to all that passed, and his rejoicing was scarcely less than theirs, to find that his schemes were working so well. But he had still much to do before supper-time, and he now returned to his books. Mysterious Music While Antonio and Sebastian were discussing their scheme to murder the king of Naples, another band of wretched creatures was plotting mischief against the lord of the island. 
when prospero had first come to this island he found it inhabited by a hideous young monster called caliban the son of a wicked witch who had been banished there from her own country this witch sycorax had for servant the dainty sprite ariel and because ariel refused to obey her evil commands she imprisoned him as a punishment in the trunk of a cloven pine tree here ariel abode in torment and misery for twelve years during which time sycorax died and left her son caliban as the only inhabitant of the island prospero on his arrival set ariel free and took him into his own service and pitying the young caliban he at first tried by kindness to tame his savage nature but all his efforts were useless caliban hated everything good and repaid prospero's kindness with malice and evil doing prospero found that gentle means were of no avail and that the only way in which to keep caliban in order was to treat him with stern severity for this caliban hated his master and was always longing to be revenged on him among those saved from the king's ship were two worthless scamps trincolo a jester and stefano a drunken butler caliban meeting them by chance immediately begged to become their servant hoping by this means to escape from prospero he further offered to lead them to where prospero lay asleep so that they might kill the magician it was agreed that stefano was then to marry miranda and become the lord of the island and caliban was to be his servant while they were talking ariel entered invisible he listened to their plots and amused himself by speaking a few words every now and then which soon set the conspirators quarrelling for they none of them knew where the voice came from and thought it was one of themselves mocking the others finally ariel began to play mysterious music on a pipe and table stefano and trinculo were greatly alarmed but caliban soothed them saying that the island was full of noises and sweet sounds which gave delight and did no hurt sometimes a thousand instruments will hum about my ears he said and sometimes voices which if i wake after a long sleep will make me sleep again then in dreams the clouds seem to open and show riches ready to drop on me so that when i awake i cry to dream again this will prove a brave kingdom to me when i shall have my music for nothing said stefano when prospero is destroyed put in caliban that shall be at once replied stefano the sound is going away let us follow it and do our work afterwards said trinculo go on monster we will follow said stefano to caliban i would i could see this taborer he plays bravely so with this mysterious music ariel lured the three villains away he led them a pretty dance through briars sharp firs prickly gorse and thorns which ran into their poor shins and finally he left them in the filthy water of a stagnant pool not far from prospero's cell in the meanwhile alonso king of naples and his party were still wandering about the island but by and by they grew so weary that poor old gonzalo declared he could go no further i cannot blame you said king alonso for i myself am dull with weariness sit down and rest now here i give up hope that i shall ever see my son again he is drowned and the sea mocks our useless search on land the traitor antonio was delighted to see that the king had lost all hope and he begged sebastian not to give up their wicked scheme because it had been once repulsed the next advantage we will take thoroughly sebastian whispered back to antonio let it be to-night said antonio for now they are so worn out with travel they will not and cannot use such vigilance as when they are fresh i say to-night agreed sebastian no more at that moment strange and solemn music was heard what harmony is this said the king hark my good friends a marvellous sweet music said gonzalo unseen by them prospero entered 
and by his magic art he caused a number of strange and grotesque figures to appear who brought in a banquet after dancing round it with gentle actions of greeting and inviting the king and his companions to eat they disappeared give us kind keepers heaven what were these explained the startled king if i reported this in naples would they believe me said gonzalo these must be islanders and, and although they are of such strange shapes yet note their manners are more gentle and kind than many of our human race you speak well honest lord said prospero aside but some of you there are worse than devils they vanish strangely said francisco no matter since they left their viands behind them said sebastian will it please your majesty to taste of what is here uh, not i said alonso hey sir you, you need not fear said gonzalo well i will eat although it be my last meal said the king brother and you my lord duke of milan do as we do at that instance there was a peal of thunder and a flash of lightning ariel in the form of a harpy a hideous bird of prey flew in and flapped his wings over the table and immediately the banquet vanished you are three men of sin whom destiny has cast upon this island because you are quite unfit to live among men he said addressing alonso sebastian and antonio enraged they drew their swords but ariel only mocked at them you fools i and my fellows are ministers of fate your swords might as well try to wound the winds or stab the water as hurt one feather of my plumage if you could hurt your swords are now too heavy for your strength and you cannot lift them but remember for this is my business to you that you three supplanted the good duke prospero from milan cast him and his innocent child adrift on the sea which hath now revenged it the heavenly powers have delayed punishment for this foul deed but they have not forgotten it and now they have incensed the sea and the shore and all creatures against you they have bereft you alonso of your son and they pronounce by me that lingering perdition worse than any death shall fall in this desolate island on you and all your ways unless you heartily repent and amend your life ariel vanished in thunder and then to soft music entered the strange shapes again and with a mocking dance carried out the table on which the banquet had been spread bravely done my ariel said prospero aside while the king of naples and his companions stood mute with amazement my charms are working and these my enemies are quite astounded they are now in my power and here i will leave them while i visit young ferdinand whom they think drowned and his and my love darling in the name of heaven sir why do you stand with that strange stare asked gonzalo of the king oh, it is monstrous monstrous cried the conscience-stricken alonso i thought the billows spoke and told me of my wicked deed the winds sang it to me and the thunder pronounced the name of prospero therefore my son is drowned and i will lie with him fathoms deep below the waves so saying he hurried from the spot followed at once by sebastian and antonio all oh, three of them are desperate said gonzalo their great guilt like poison which takes a long time to work now begins to bite their spirit i do beseech you he added to the lords in waiting follow them swiftly and hinder them from what this madness may provoke them to do end of section two section three of the shakespeare story book this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org though the seas threaten they are merciful the hard toil which prospero had set the prince of naples did not last long and when the magician saw that the young people loved each other sincerely he put an end to the trial 
and bade them be happy together to give them pleasure and show them some proof of his magic powers he summoned a troop of beautiful spirits iris ceres juno some water nymphs and various reapers who sang sweet songs to them and danced graceful dances but the moment of caliban's plot was approaching prospero dismissed the spirits and began to prepare for punishing the conspirators sending ferdinand and miranda to wait for him in his cell he bade ariel fetch some glistening apparel and hang it up on a line near in order to serve as a bait to catch the thieves his plan succeeded caliban stefano and trinculo soon appeared all wet from the stagnant pool into which they had been lured by ariel's music pray you tread softly that the blind mole may not hear a footfall we are now near his cell said caliban o oh, king stefano o oh, peer o oh, worthy stefano look what a wardrobe is here for you cried trinculo catching hold of the garments hanging on the line let it along you fool it is but trash said caliban put you off that gown trinculo said stefano equally greedy in his turn by this hand i'll have that gown y your grace shall have it said trinculo submissively why do you waste time on this rubbish entreated caliban let us do the murder first if prospero awakens he will punish us cruelly for this you be quiet monster said stefano rudely and he and trinculo went on helping themselves to the fine clothes which ariel had cunningly displayed come monster take what we leave ah, i will have none of them declared caliban we shall lose our time and if prospero catches us he will change us all into barnacles or apes oh pussy carry these away or i'll turn you out in my kingdom go to carry this commanded stefano and this added trinculo and they began to load poor caliban with their spoils suddenly a noise of hunters was heard and a band of spirits in the shape of dogs swept along and set upon the three guilty men chasing them about while prospero and ariel urged on the dogs hey mountain hey silver there it goes silver fury fury there tyrant here hark hark when caliban stefano and trinculo had been driven away prospero spoke to ariel let them be hunted soundly now all my enemies lie at my mercy my labours will soon be ended and then thou shalt be as free as air follow me still for a little and do my service now tell me how fares the king and his followers just as you left them all prisoners sir in the grove of trees which shelters your cell they cannot stir until you release them the king his brother and your brother are quite distracted and their lords are mourning over them and chiefly he whom you termed the good old lord gonzalo your charm affects them so strongly that if you beheld them now you would pity them dost thou think so spirit i would sir if i were human and i will said prospero now that they are penitent my purpose is accomplished go release them ariel i'll break my charms i'll restore their senses and they shall be themselves i'll fetch them sir said ariel and he gladly hastened away to do his master's bidding left alone prospero took a solemn farewell of all the powers of magic which he had practised for so long and declared that after one last charm which he was now going to work he would break his wizard's wand and drown his book when ariel returned with alonso sebastian and antonio and the lords in waiting they all entered a charmed circle which prospero had made and stood there unable to move there stand for you are spellbound said prospero o oh, good gonzalo my true preserver and loyal servant to your master i will pay you both in word and deed alonso 
most cruelly did you use me and my daughter your brother helped you in the deed he is punished for it now you brother mine unnatural though you are i forgive you while prospero was speaking the king and his companions slowly began to recover their senses but they did not yet recognize prospero for he was clad in his magic robes fetch me the hat and rapier in my cell ariel he said i will discard these garments and show myself as when i was duke of milan quickly spirit thou shalt be free ere long gladly ariel set to work singing a gay little song as he helped to attire his master where the bees suck there suck i in a cowslip bell i lie there i couch when i was to cry on the bat's back i do fly after summer merrily 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 shall i live now under the blossom that hangs on the bough then prospero sent him to find the king's ship and to bring back the master and boatswain poor old gonzalo was greatly amazed and troubled at all the strange things that were happening some heavenly power guide us out of this fearful country he exclaimed behold sir king the wronged duke of milan prospero said the magician to alonso to give thee more assurance than a living prince speaks to thee i embrace thee and bid a hearty welcome to thee and thy company whether thou be he or not or some enchanted trifle to torment me i do not know said the bewildered king thy pulse beats like flesh and blood and since i have seen thee my madness has abated i resign thy dukedom and entreat thy pardon for my wrongdoing but how can prospero be living and be here welcome my friends all said prospero but you my brace of lords he added aside to sebastian and antonio if i were so minded i could make his highness frown on you and prove you traitors at this time i will tell no tales the devil speaks in him muttered sebastian conscious of his guilt no replied prospero quietly for you most wicked sir he said to his brother antonio i forgive all your faults and require my dukedom of thee which perforce i know thou must restore if you are prospero tell us how you were saved and how you have met us here said the king of naples three hours ago we were wrecked upon this shore alas where i have lost how bitter is the remembrance my dear son ferdinand i am sorry for it sir said prospero the loss can never be made up and is past the cure of patience i rather think you have not sought the help of patience said prospero for the like loss i have its sovereign aid and rest myself content you the like loss as great to me for i have lost my daughter a daughter cried alonso oh would that they were both living in naples as king and queen when did you lose your daughter in this last tempest said prospero smiling to himself but come no more of this welcome sir this cell is my court i have a few attendants here and no subjects abroad pray you look in since you have given me back my dukedom i will reward you with something equally good or at least show you a wonder which will content you as much as my dukedom does me and drawing aside the curtain which veiled the entrance to his cell prospero disclosed to view ferdinand and miranda playing at chess sweet lord you played me false said miranda no my dearest love i would not for the world said ferdinand if this prove a vision of the island i shall lose my dear son a second time murmured alonso a most high miracle exclaimed sebastian though the seas threaten they are merciful cried ferdinand springing from his seat at the sight of his father and falling on his knees before him now all the blessings of a glad father compass thee about said alonso 
overcome with joy to see his son again. Miranda, in the meanwhile, was gazing in wonder at all these strange visitors who had come to the island. "'Oh, brave new world that has such people in it!' she cried in delight. "'Who is this maiden?' Alonso asked his son. "'Is she some goddess?' "'Sir, she is mortal, and she is mine,' answered Ferdinand. "'I chose her when I thought I had no father. She is a daughter to the famous Duke of Milan, of whose renown I have so often heard.' Then Alonso gave his blessing to the young couple, and the good Gonzalo breathed a hearty, "'Amen!' At this moment Ariel appeared, followed by the astonished master of the king's ship and the boatswain. They were overjoyed to see the king and his companions again, and brought word that the ship was as safe and bravely rigged as when they first put out to sea. "'Sir, all this service have I done since I left you,' whispered Ariel to Prospero. "'Was it well done?' "'Bravely, good spirit,' said Prospero. "'Thou shalt soon be free.' Then he commanded him to go and take off the spell from Caliban and his companions, and after a few minutes' absence, Ariel returned, driving in the three men clad in their stolen apparel. "'Mark these men, my lords,' said Prospero. "'These three have robbed me, and this witch's son has plotted with the others to take my life.' Two of these fellows you must know and own. This thing of darkness, I acknowledge mine. Is not this Stefano my drunken butler? said the King of Naples. Well, how now, Stefano? said Sebastian mockingly. You would be king of this isle, sirrah? demanded Prospero. Uh, I should have been a sore one then, groaned Stefano, for he and his worthless friends were still aching all over from the punishment inflicted on them. "'That is a stranger thing as ever I looked on,' said Alonso, pointing to Caliban. "'His manners are as ugly as his appearance,' answered Prospero. "'Go, sirrah, to my cell. Take your companions with you, and if you hope to have my pardon, behave properly.' "'Aye, that I will,' said Caliban. A "'And I will be wise hereafter, and try to be better.' What a thrice double ass I was to take that drunkard for my master. And he departed with his companions, glad to have escaped so lightly. Then Prospero invited the king and his other guests into his cell, where they were to rest for one night. The next morning they were all to set sail for Naples, where the marriage between Prince Ferdinand and Miranda was to take place after which Prospero would retire to his own dukedom of Milan. Finally, he gave his last charge to Ariel, and bade him see that the king's ship should have calm seas and fair winds to waft it quickly on its way. "'My Ariel, chick that is thy charge,' said Prospero, "'then be as free as the elements, and fare thee well.'" End of the Tempest Read by Craig Franklin End of section 3「Section 4 of the Shakespeare Storybook – This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, Please visit LibriVox.org. The Shakespeare Storybook by Mary MacLeod. Two Gentlemen of Verona, Part One. Now let us take our leave. There lived once in Verona two friends who loved each other dearly. Their names were Valentine and Proteus. They were both young and gallant gentlemen, but they were very different in character, as you will presently see. Valentine was simple and honest a loyal and devoted friend, and too candid and sincere himself to think of treachery in others. Proteus had warm affections, but he was fickle and changeable, carried away by impulse, and always so desperately eager for what he happened to want at the moment that he stopped at no means to gain his ends. Valentine and Proteus were very happy together as companions, 
but at last the time came when they were to part. Valentine was not content to settle down at Verona. He wanted to see something of the world and its wider life. Home-keeping youth have ever homely wits, he said to Proteus, who was trying to persuade him to stay. If it were not that you were chained here by your affections, I would rather beg your company to see the wonders of the world abroad. But since you are in love, love still, and thrive in it, even as I would when I once begin to love. This he said, because Proteus was deeply in love at that moment with a fair lady of Verona called Julia. And then Valentine went on to tease Proteus, pretending that all love was folly, and that only foolish people let themselves be deluded into it. He little knew how soon he was himself to be caught in the same folly, and how basely and treacherously his friend was going to act towards him. However, at that moment Proteus had no thought of any one but Julia, and would not have left Verona on any account. The two friends took an affectionate farewell of each other, and Valentine went his way to travel to the court of Milan. He hunts after honor, I after love, thought Proteus, when his friend had left him. He leaves his friends to bring more credit to them by improving himself. I leave myself, my friends, and all, for love. Thou, Julia, hast changed me, made me neglect my studies, lose my time, fight against good counsel, set the world at naught, weaken my brains with dreaming, and make my heart sick with thought. While Proteus was indulging in this rhapsody, Speed, the clownish servant of Valentine, came hurrying up. Sir Proteus, save you! he cried in the greeting of those days. Saw you, my master? He has just this minute gone to embark for Milan, replied Proteus. Did you give my letter to the Lady Julia? Yes, sir, and she gave me nothing for my labor, said Speed, who was out of temper at not having received the handsome fee he was hoping for. But what did she say? asked Proteus eagerly. Oh, she nodded. Come, come, what did she say? Will you open your purse, sir? Well, there is something for your trouble. Now, what did she say? Truly, sir, I think you will hardly win her, said Speed with a sly look, pocketing the piece of money Proteus threw to him. Why? Could you perceive so much from her manner? Sir, I could perceive nothing at all from her. No, not so much as a ducat for delivering your letter. And as she was so hard to me, who is your messenger, I fear she will prove equally hard to you. Give her no present but a stone, for she is as hard as steel. What did she say? Nothing? repeated poor Proteus. No, not so much as take that for your pains, said Speed, still harping on his own grievance. I thank you for your bounty, sir. Henceforth carry your letters yourself, and so I will go seek my master. Go, go, to save your ship from wreck cried Proteus, incensed at the fellow's impertinence. It cannot perish when you are aboard, for you are certainly destined for a drier death on shore. I must find some better messenger to send, he added to himself, when the saucy serving-man had taken off. I am afraid my Julia would not deign to accept my lines, receiving them from such a worthless envoy. But, as it happened, the letter had so far not reached the hands of the lady for whom it was intended, for it was only her waiting maid Lucetta whom Speed had seen, and to whom he had given the letter in mistake for Julia. Lucetta went in search of her mistress, and found her in the garden, musing over many things, for by this time Julia really loved Proteus, though she would not acknowledge it even to herself. When Lucetta handed her the letter, saying she thought it had been sent by Proteus, Julia pretended to be angry, and scolded her maid for daring to receive it. Here! Take the paper again, she said, and see that it is returned, or never again come into my presence. To plead for love deserves a better reward than to be scolded, muttered Lucetta. From being so much with her young mistress, the maid was treated more as a companion than as a servant, and was accustomed to speak out her mind frankly on every occasion. Go, said Julia, severely, but no sooner had Lucetta disappeared than she was seized with remorse. How churlishly I sent her away, when all the time I wanted her here, she thought. How angrily I tried to frown, when really my heart was smiling with secret joy. 
to punish myself i must call lucetta back and ask her pardon for my folly what ho lucetta what does your ladyship want asked lucetta reappearing but at the sight of her maid julia suddenly became shy again is it near dinner time she asked with an air of pretended indifference i would it were madam so that you might spend your anger on your meat and not on your maid replied lucetta rather flippantly and at that moment she let the letter fall and picked it up ostentatiously what is it you took up so gingerly inquired julia nothing why did you stoop then to pick up a paper i let fall and is that paper nothing nothing that concerns me then let it lie there for whom it does concern but lucetta had no intention that the letter should lie unheeded on the ground for her only purpose in dropping it was to bring it again to julia's notice she little knew how her mistress longed at that moment to have it in her own possession but was too proud to acknowledge it lucetta could not refrain from some pert speeches and her jesting words irritated julia especially when lucetta declared she was taking the part of proteus i will have no more chatter about this said julia and she tore the letter and threw the pieces on the ground go get you gone and let the papers lie she pretends not to like it but she would be very well pleased to be so angered with another letter said the shrewd maid half aloud as she walked away nay would i were so angered with the same cried julia eagerly seizing some of the fragments oh hateful hands to tear such loving words i'll kiss each little piece of paper to make amends look here is written kind julia unkind julia be calm good wind do not blow any of the words away until i have found every letter and with a loving touch she began carefully to collect the torn scraps of paper madame said lucetta coming back dinner is ready and your father waits well let us go said julia are these papers to lie here like tell-tales madam if you care about them you had better pick them up they shall not stay here for fear of catching cold said lucetta with a mischievous little smile to herself i see you are very anxious to have them said julia ah madam you may say what sight you see said the maid quite unabashed i see things too though you judge my eyes are shut come come let us go said julia proteus had refused to accompany his friend valentine but he soon found that he was not to be allowed to remain at verona in those days it was considered that no young man was well brought up unless he had had the advantage of foreign travel and an uncle of his spoke very strongly on the subject i wonder that his father lets him spend his youth at home he said while other men of much less repute send out their sons to seek preferment some to the wars to try their fortune there some to discover islands far away some to study at the universities for any or for all of these proteus is fit it will be a great disadvantage to him in after years to have known no travel in his youth to this proteus's father antonio answered that he had already been thinking over the matter i have reflected how he is wasting his time and how he can never be a perfect man unless he goes out in the world to learn by experience he said and he came to the conclusion that he could do no better than send proteus after valentine to the court of the duke of milan proteus was ordered to hold himself in readiness to start the next day and all appeals were useless the only consolation he had in leaving julia was that the lady now frankly admitted his love keep this remembrance for thy julia's sake she said giving him a ring when the moment came to part why then we'll make an exchange said proteus here take you this and here is my hand for my true constancy if ever i do not remember you for a single hour julia the next hour let some evil mischance torment me for my forgetfulness and so with many protestations of love and fidelity proteus started to rejoin his friend valentine at milan and julia was left behind at verona end of section four recording by todd section five of the shakespeare story book this is a librivox recording 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Shakespeare Storybook by Mary MacLeod Section 5, Two Gentlemen of Verona, Part 2 Who is Sylvia? False to his friend. Who is Sylvia? Valentine had spoken many wise words to Proteus on the folly of being in love, but he had not been long in Milan before he was in just the same sad plight that he had cautioned his friend against. The Duke of Milan had a beautiful daughter called Sylvia, and it was with her that Valentine fell deeply in love. She returned his affection, and they became secretly betrothed, but they dared not let this be known, for her father favoured another suitor, Sir Thurio, a rich and well-born gentleman, but foolish and extremely vain. The Duke of Milan, as was the custom in those days, thought himself at perfect liberty to dispose of his daughter in marriage as best pleased himself, but with scant regard for her own feelings on the subject. He suspected there was some love between Sylvia and Valentine, and saw many little things when they thought him blind. He often determined to forbid Valentine his court and his daughter's company, but, fearing that his jealousy might perhaps be leading him into error, and that he might bring disgrace unworthily upon Valentine, he resolved not to act rashly, but by gentle means to try to discover the truth. In the meantime, he kept a strict watch over Sylvia, and fearing some attempt on the part of the young lovers to escape secretly, he gave directions that Sylvia should be lodged in an upper tower, the key of which was brought every night to himself. Matters were in this state when, to Valentine's great joy, Proteus arrived at the court of Milan. In the full warmth of his generous heart, Valentine lavished praises of his friend to the Duke of Milan and to Sylvia, and for the sake of the love she bore to Valentine, Sylvia gave Proteus a hearty welcome. But what a base return Proteus made for the kindness heaped upon him! In spite of the devotion which he had professed for Julia, in spite of his lifelong friendship with Valentine, Proteus no sooner beheld Sylvia than he imagined himself desperately in love with her. All thought of loyalty and honor was recklessly flung aside. He knew that he was behaving shamefully. He remembered his faithful lady in Verona. He called to mind the duty he owed his dear friend Valentine. But for the moment his weak and selfish nature carried him beyond control. He had no thought but to gratify his own desires, and he determined to throw over Julia and to win Sylvia for himself at whatever cost of treachery and dishonor. The task did not seem an impossible one, for Valentine, in the full glow of his unsuspicious nature, was ready to place unbounded trust in his friend, and in this way he gave into his hands the means by which he was betrayed. He told Proteus that, unknown to the Duke, her father, Sylvia and he were betrothed, nay, more, that the hour of their marriage and the method of their flight were already arranged. Sylvia was locked into her tower every night, but Valentine was to come with a ladder of ropes, by which he could climb up and help her to descend. That very evening was fixed for the carrying out of their scheme, and Valentine was now on his way to procure the ladder of ropes by which the attempt was to be made. Proteus listened to this plot, and then, in the depths of his meanness, he determined to give Sylvia's father notice of what was planned, for he thought it would turn out greatly to his own advantage to do so. Valentine would be banished, and the way would be left open for himself to try to win Sylvia. True, her father favoured another suitor, Sir Thurio, but Proteus had little fear of that dull gentleman, and he thought it would be very easy to thwart his proceedings with some sly trick. Proteus lost no time in carrying out his scheme, and it was immediately successful. With feigned reluctance, and under the hypocritical pretense that he was only acting from a sense of duty, Proteus repeated to the Duke of Milan what Valentine had told him. He made the Duke promise that he would not reveal his treachery, and pointed out how he could easily entrap Valentine, as if the discovery had been made by himself. The Duke acted on this advice. He pretended to ask Valentine's counsel as to the best way of winning a lady to be his wife, whose friends kept her securely shut up. Valentine at once suggested the method of escape which he was hoping to use in his own case. A ladder quaintly made of cords, he said, with hooks at the end which you can throw up, and by which you can scale the tower. "'But how shall I convey the ladder? asked the Duke. "'It will be so light, my lord, that you can easily carry it under your cloak,' said Valentine. "'Will a cloak as long as yours serve the purpose?' "'Why, any cloak will serve, my lord. 
how shall i wear it said the duke pray let me feel your cloak upon me valentine could scarcely refuse and the next moment the duke had drawn forth from the cloak not only a letter addressed to sylvia saying that valentine would set her free that night but also the ladder of ropes that was to be used for that purpose then the duke's anger blazed forth go base intruder overweening slave he exclaimed and in words of the most contemptuous wrath he ordered valentine to leave his court and his territories and never to be seen in them again on pain of death false to his friend the duke of milan had scarcely left valentine and the latter was still dazed by the calamity which had befallen him when proteus brought him word that the proclamation for his banishment had been made public sylvia however was still true to him with sobs and tears she implored pardon for him on her knees but her father was relentless if valentine were found again in his dominions he should be put to death moreover he was so enraged at his daughter's daring to plead for her young lover that he commanded she should be kept in close prison the crafty proteus counselled valentine to depart at once bidding him not to lose hope pretending the greatest sympathy with his love affairs and promising that if he sent letters they should be safely conveyed to sylvia having thus hurried valentine away with the utmost dispatch proteus returned to the duke of milan to let him know that his orders had been obeyed my daughter is in great grief about his going said the duke a little time will kill that grief my lord so i believe but sir thurio here does not think so said the duke and he then went on to consult proteus as to the best way of winning sylvia's affections from the absent valentine in order that she might transfer them to sir thurio it was agreed among them that the best plan would be for proteus to speak all he could in dispraise of valentine while at the same time he was to speak in praise of sir thurio for this purpose proteus was to be allowed free access to sylvia who for his friend's sake would be glad to see him proteus agreed to this but said that thurio himself must do something to win the lady's favor he suggested that he should try to please her with poetry and music and that he should bring musicians and sing a serenade by night under her chamber window thurio said he would put the plan in practice that very night he knew some gentlemen well skilled in music and he had a song written that would be just suitable as for the duke he was delighted with the suggestion and bade them set to work at once to carry it into effect meanwhile in verona julia was sorrowing for the absence of proteus and at last her longing to see him again grew so keen that she determined to follow him to milan her waiting-maid lucetta who had plenty of shrewd common sense tried to persuade her not to go but julia would listen to no reason i feel as if i were dying with starvation until i see him again she said if you only knew what it is to love any one you would know how utterly useless it is to try to argue about it in words as a young and beautiful lady travelling alone would be likely to attract a good deal of notice for safety's sake julia decided to adopt the dress of a page and she bade lucetta procure for her all that was necessary to play the part properly in vain lucetta tried to warn her that perhaps proteus would not be pleased to see her many men were fickle and changeable she said they often pretended much more affection than they really felt julia indignantly replied that some men might but not her proteus her trust in his fidelity was not to be shaken his words are bonds his oaths cannot be broken his love is sincere his thoughts are stainless his tears are pure messengers straight from heaven his heart is as free from fraud as heaven from earth she cried pray heavens he proves so when you come to him said the shrewd waiting woman so the faithful loving julia set out on her journey to milan alas poor lady she little knew what a sorry welcome was awaiting her end of section five recording by todd Section number six of the Shakespeare Storybook. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Shakespeare Storybook by Mary MacLeod. Two Gentlemen of Verona, Part Three. Alas, poor lady, desolate and left. Proteus soon found 
that his scheme for winning Sylvia met with small success. He had already been false to Valentine, and now he intended to be false to Sir Turio. But his treachery was likely to be of little avail. Sylvia was far too good and true to be corrupted by his worthless gifts. When he protested his loyalty to her, she twitted him with his falsehood to his absent friend. When he praised her beauty, she bade him remember how he had been forsworn in breaking faith with Julia, whom he loved. But notwithstanding all her rebuffs and rebukes, the more she spurned Proteus, the greater grew his admiration for her. And though he knew well how basely he was acting both to Valentine and Julia, he had not enough strength of mind to turn aside from the temptation. That night, in accordance with what they had planned, Sir Torio brought a band of musicians, and they sang a charming serenade outside the Duke of Milan's palace, under Sylvia's chamber. This is the pretty song they sang. Who is Sylvia? What is she? That all our swains commend her. Holy, fair, and wise is she. The heaven such grace did lend her, that she might admired be. Is she kind as she is fair? For beauty lives with kindness. Love doth to her eyes repair, to help him of his blindness and, being helped, inhabits there. Then to Sylvia let us sing, that Sylvia is excelling. She excels each mortal thing upon the dull earth dwelling. To her garlands let us bring. Unknown to Proteus, there was another listener of whom he little recked. Julia, on arriving at Milan, had made inquiries for her faithless lover, and the landlord of the house where she lodged had brought her to this spot to see the man for whom she had been inquiring. Now, in her page's costume, she was a witness of her lover's inconstancy. Proteus had sworn a thousand vows of love to her, and yet here he was, plainly playing court to another lady. Poor Julia! Sweet as the music was, it had little charm for her. She heard only the jarring discord of her lover's false words. "'Does this Sir Proteus that we speak of often come to visit this gentlewoman?' she asked her host. "'I tell you what, Lance, his man told me. He loves her beyond all measure,' replied the host. "'Peace, stand aside, they are going,' said Julia, stepping further back into the shadow. And she heard Proteus say, "'Sir Terrio, do not fear. I will plead your cause so well that you will own my cunning wit is matchless.' "'Where do we meet?' asked Sir Thurio, as he prepared to depart with the musicians. "'At St. Gregory's well. Farewell.' And Proteus was left alone as Sylvia appeared on the balcony of her window above. "'Madam, good even to your ladyship,' said Proteus. "'I thank you for your music, gentlemen. Who was that who spoke?' "'One lady, whom, if you knew his true heart, you would quickly learn to know by his voice.' Sir Proteus, I take it. Sir Proteus, gentle lady, and your servant. What is your will? That I may fulfill yours. You have your wish. My will is this, that you immediately go home to bed, you subtle, perjured, false, disloyal man. Do you think I am so shallow, so witless, as to be won by your flattery? You, who have deceived so many by your vows? Return, return and make amends to your own lady. As for me, I swear by this moon that I am so far from granting your request that I despise you for your wrongful suit, and could chide myself even for the time I spend in talking to you. I grant that I did love a lady, said Proteus, but she is dead. Supposing that she is, yet Valentine, your friend, is alive, to whom you yourself are witness that I am betrothed. Are you not ashamed to wrong him with his persistency? I hear likewise that Valentine is dead. Imagine, then, that I also am dead, for, be assured, my love is buried in his grave. Sweet lady, let me take it from the earth. Go to your own lady's grave, and call her love thence, or at least bury your own in hers. Madam, if your heart be so pitiless, yet grant me your picture for the sake of my love, for since you yourself are devoted elsewhere, I am but a shadow, and to your shadow will I give my love. I am very loath to be your idol, sir, but since it suits your falsehood to admire shadows, send to me in the morning, and I will send the picture. And so, good rest. 
"'As wretches have overnight who wait for execution in the morning,' said Proteus. Poor Julia overheard all this conversation between her faithless suitor and the Lady Sylvia. It was impossible to doubt his falsehood any longer, yet so true and loving was her nature that she could not harden her heart to go away and never see him again. As it happened, Sir Proteus was staying at the very house in Milan where she had found a lodging. His thoughts just then were entirely absorbed with his latest fancy, and it never occurred to him to connect the stranger lad, who called himself Sebastian, with his own Lady Julia at Verona. But something about the pretty boy attracted his liking. Proteus's servant, Lance, was a silly clown, whose half-witted blunders were always bringing his master into ridicule, and, judging from Sebastian's face and bearing that he was well-born and trustworthy, Proteus took him into his service as page. End of Section 6 Recording by Todd Section 7 of the Shakespeare Storybook This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Shakespeare Storybook by Mary MacLeod Two Gentlemen of Verona, Part 4 What Befell in the Forest Those were dark days for the Lady Sylvia. Her lover Valentine vanished. She herself kept in close imprisonment by her angry and tyrannical father, threatened with marriage to a suitor whom she hated and despised. What prospect of relief could she look forward to? But she was not without courage, and she was not without hope. At the court of Milan there was one friend on whom she could rely, the kind Sir Eglamour, a gentleman, valiant, wise, compassionate, well accomplished, one who had himself known sorrow, for his lady and true love had died, and his heart still mourned her memory. Sylvia told this gentleman that she was anxious to go to Valentine, to Mantua, where she had heard he was staying, and because the ways were dangerous, she begged him to accompany her, in whose faith and honor she trusted. Pitying her distress, and knowing that the Duke was acting cruelly in trying to force his daughter into an unworthy marriage, Sir Eglamour willingly agreed, and it was arranged they should start that evening. Sir Eglamour had scarcely left Sylvia when the messenger arrived from Proteus to claim the portrait which Sylvia had promised. And who should Proteus have chosen for this errand but his new young page, Sebastian, whom he little thought was his own dear Lady Julia in disguise. Not only this, but he also entrusted a ring to Sebastian to give to Sylvia, and this ring was no other than the one which Julia had given to him when they parted and which he had received with so many protestations of affection and vows of fidelity. Julia, or Sebastian, as we ought now to call her, was nearly heartbroken at the task imposed on her, but she carried it through faithfully. And in one way she met with her reward, for the noble Lady Sylvia showed no pleasure at this proof of Proteus's affection, only scorn and indignation at his treachery to his own love. She gave her portrait, as she had promised it, but she tore up his letter in contempt, without even reading it, and as for the ring, she refused to accept it. "'Madam, he sends your ladyship this ring,' said the pretty lad Sebastian. "'The more shame on him that he sends it to me,' said Sylvia warmly, "'for I have heard him say a thousand times that Julia gave it him at his departure. "'Though his false fingers have profaned the ring, "'mine shall never do his Julia so much wrong,' she declared. "'Julia was deeply touched and grateful at Sylvia's generous sympathy.' and still more so when the lady went on to question her about Julia, and to say how much she felt for her, and pitied her. Alas, poor lady, desolate and left! I could weep for her, she said. Here, youth, there is my purse. I give you this for your sweet mistress's sake, because you love her. Farewell. And she shall thank you for it, if ever I know her, cried Julia, as Sylvia retired with her attendants. A virtuous gentlewoman! mild and beautiful. I hope my master's suit will be but cold, since she respects my mistress's love so much. And somewhat comforted, she returned to Proteus. Sylvia fled that night, as she had arranged with Sir Eglamour. The news soon reached her father's ears, and he immediately set out in pursuit of her, the party also including Sir Thurio, Proteus, and Sebastian. But in crossing a dangerous forest, Sir Eglamour and Sylvia had been seized by a band of outlaws. Sir Eglamour contrived to make his escape, but the outlaws were conveying Sylvia to their chief, 
when Proteus came up with them, and with some difficulty rescued their captive. Now the captain of these outlaws was no other than Valentine. On his way to Mantua he had been taken prisoner by the band, who, seeing that he was a brave and accomplished gentleman, had begged him to be their chief. Finding that they were not really bad men, but had been driven to this method of life by reckless behavior in their youth, which had caused them to be banished from Milan, Valentine consented. "'I accept your offer and will live with you,' he said, "'provided that you do no harm to women or poor travelers.' "'No, we detest such vile practices,' said one of the outlaws. "'Come, go with us. "'We will take you to the rest of our crew "'and show you all the treasure we have got, "'and everything shall be at your disposal.' "'On the day when the adventure occurred "'to Sir Eglamour and Sylvia, "'Valentine happened to be alone, "'when, unseen by them in the thickness of the forest, "'he saw Proteus approaching with Sylvia "'and the little page, Sebastian. "'Madam,' he heard Proteus say, I have done this service for you, and risked my life, though you do not respect anything that your servant does. Grant me but a kind look for my reward. I cannot ask a smaller boon than that, and less than that I am sure you cannot give. This is like a dream, thought Valentine, aghast at his friend's treachery. But he tried to wait patiently for a few minutes to see what would happen. Oh, miserable, unhappy that I am, sighed Sylvia. "'And I, too,' murmured the poor little page, apart. "'Had I been seized by a hungry lion, "'I would rather have been a breakfast to the beast "'than have false Proteus rescue me,' cried Sylvia. "'Oh, heaven, be judge how I love Valentine, "'whose life is as dear to me as my soul. "'And just as much, for it cannot be more, "'do I detest false, perjured Proteus. "'Therefore be gone, entreat me no more.' Seeing there was no chance of winning Sylvia by fair words, Proteus, in a rage, seized hold of her roughly, whereupon Valentine sprang forth and struck him back. "'Ruffian, let go that rude, uncivil touch! Thou evil-fashioned friend!' "'Valentine!' "'You miserable friend, without faith or love!' continued Valentine, hurling his scorn on the convicted traitor. "'Treacherous man! Thou hast beguiled my hopes!' Nothing but my own eyes would have made me believe what I see. Now I dare not say I have one living friend. Whom could I trust when the one nearest my heart is perjured? Proteus, I am sorry I must never trust thee more. But for thy sake count the whole world a stranger. Alas, that amongst all foes a friend should be the worst. Proteus's easily moved nature was struck to the heart by Valentine's just reproaches. With deepest remorse he implored Valentine's pardon, and so noble and generous was Valentine that he forgave him on the spot. Nay, more, in the impulse of the moment he even offered to resign his own claim on Sylvia. The thought that Proteus would now really be lost to her for ever struck Julia like a blow, and she fell fainting to the ground. "'Look to the boy,' said Proteus. "'Why, boy, how now? What's the matter? Look up!' speak said valentine oh good sir my master charged me to deliver a ring to madame sylvia which because of my neglect was never done said julia in her guise of the little page where is that ring boy asked proteus here it is this is it how let me see why this is the ring i gave to julia oh cry you mercy sir i have made a mistake said Julia, pretending to discover her error, and holding out another one. This is the ring you sent to Sylvia. But how did you come by this ring? asked Proteus, looking at the first one. When I left Verona, I gave this to Julia. And Julia herself gave it to me, and Julia herself has brought it here. How? Julia! Behold her to whom you swore so many vows, and who kept them tenderly in her heart. "'How often have you perjured yourself?' cried Julia, throwing off her disguise. "'Oh, Proteus, let these clothes make you blush. "'Are you ashamed that I have put on the raiment of a boy? "'I tell you, it is less shameful for women to change their guise than men their minds.' "'Than men their minds?' echoed the conscience-stricken Proteus. "'That is true.' "'Come, come, give me each your hand,' interposed Valentine. Let me be blessed in making a happy ending. It were pity that two such friends should be long foes. Bear witness, heaven, 
I have my wish for ever, said Proteus solemnly. And I mine, said Julia. And it is to be hoped that this time the fickle gentleman kept faithful to his lady. Matters had scarcely come to this happy conclusion when the outlaws approached, bringing as captives the Duke of Milan and Sir Torrio. A prize! A prize! A prize! shouted the outlaws. Forbear, forbear, I say. It is my lord, the Duke of Milan, said Valentine. Your grace is welcome to a man disgraced, he added courteously. Sir Valentine. Yonder is Sylvia, and Sylvia's mine, interrupted Sir Turio, pressing rudely forward. Stand back, commanded Valentine. Come near at your peril. Do not dare to call Sylvia yours. There she stands. I dare you to touch her, or even to come near. Sir Valentine, I care not for her. I, said Turio, quite cowed, I hold him but a fool, who will endanger himself for a girl who does not love him. I claim her not, and therefore she is yours. The more base of you to act as you have done, and then to leave her on such slight excuse, said the Duke indignantly. Now, by the honour of my ancestry, I applaud your spirit, Valentine. You are worthy of an empress's love. Know, then, I cancel here all that has passed, and summon you home again, Sir Valentine. You are a gentleman. Take you your Sylvia, for you have deserved her. I thank your grace. The gift has made me happy. I now beg you, for your daughter's sake, to grant one boon that I shall ask of you. I grant it you for your own, whatever it be, said the duke. Then Valentine begged him to pardon the band of outlaws, and recall them from exile. They are reformed, civil, full of good, and fit for great employment, he said. The duke willingly granted his pardon, and then the whole party returned happily to Milan, where the same day wedding feasts were appointed for the two marriages, Valentine with Sylvia, and Proteus with Julia. End of section 7 Recording by Todd Section 8 of the Shakespeare Storybook. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by K. Hand. The Shakespeare Storybook by Mary MacLeod. Much Ado About Nothing, Part 1. Dear Lady Disdain, a plain dealing villain. Dear Lady Disdain, there was rejoicing in Messina, for the war was over, and Don Pedro, the victorious prince of Aragon, was returning in triumph. Tidings were sent to Leonato, the governor, to expect his speedy approach, and Leonato himself, with his daughter Hero and his niece Beatrice, received the prince's messenger, and questioned him eagerly as to the welfare of their friends. "'How many gentlemen have you lost in this action?' inquired Leonato but few of any sort, and none of name," replied the messenger. "'I find in this letter that Don Pedro has bestowed much honour on a young Florentine called Claudio,' said Leonato. "'Much deserved on his part, and equally remembered by Don Pedro,' answered the messenger. "'He has, indeed, borne himself gallantly, doing in the figure of a lamb the feats of a lion.' When she heard this outspoken praise of the young Florentine, Hero, the governor's daughter, felt a warm thrill of joy, but she only smiled and blushed with pleasure. "'I pray you,' put in Beatrice, the governor's niece, who lived in her uncle's house, and was the dear companion of his only daughter, "'is Signor Montanto returned from the wars, or no?' "'I know none of that name, lady,' said the messenger, looking rather puzzled. "'There was none such in the army of any sort.' "'Who is he that you ask for, niece?' "'My cousin means Signor Benedict of Padua,' explained Hero. "'Oh, he has returned, and as pleasant as he ever was,' said the messenger. "'I pray you, how many has he killed and eaten in these wars?' said Beatrice mockingly. "'But no, how many has he killed? For indeed I promise to eat all of his killing.' faith niece you are too hard on signor benedick said leonato but he will be even with you i do not doubt 
he has done good service lady in these wars said the messenger and then he went on to praise warmly the valor and noble qualities of the young lord but beatrice would do nothing but laugh and mock at all he said you must not sir mistake my niece said leonato at last there is a kind of merry war betwixt signor benedick and her they never meet but there is a skirmish of wit between them while they were still speaking the prince of aragon with his train of noble gentlemen arrived leonato welcomed them most warmly count claudio and signor benedick were old friends and had previously stayed at the governor's palace indeed before starting for the wars claudio had looked with more than an eye of favor on the gentle lady hero as for beatrice and benedick they pretended to have a great aversion to each other but strange to say instead of avoiding each other's society they seemed to delight in seizing every opportunity to plague and tease each other as much as possible on the present occasion beatrice had not long to wait and on benedick's making some jesting remark to don pedro and leonato she plunged into the fray i wonder that you will still be talking signor benedick nobody marks you what my dear lady disdain are you yet living retorted benedick is it possible that disdain should die while she has such meat food to feed it as signor benedick courtesy herself must turn into disdain if you come into her presence then is courtesy a turncoat but it is certain i am loved of all ladies only you excepted and i would i could find in my heart that i had not a hard heart for truly i love none remarked benedick in a lofty manner that is very happy for women they would otherwise have been troubled with a most annoying suitor said beatrice thank heaven i am like you in that respect i had rather hear my dog bark at a crow than a man swear he loves me heaven keep your ladyship still in that mind said the young lord devoutly so some gentleman or another shall escape injury it was all very well for benedick to scoff at love but the young count claudio was of a different nature impulsive and passionate he was not ashamed to own his love for the lady hero and with the sympathetic help of the prince of aragon he speedily won the lady's consent and her father's approval the wedding day was fixed for a week later and the only trial the impatient lover had to endure was the time that must elapse before the wedding benedick of course did not spare his raillery on this occasion and he laughed with the utmost scorn when don pedro and claudia declared that his own turn would come i shall see you before i die look pale with love said don pablo with anger with sickness with hunger my lord but never with love declared benedick well if ever you fall from this faith you will prove a notable argument if i do hang me in a bottle and shoot at me laughed benedick well as time shall try in time the savage bull doth bear the yoke quoted don pedro the savage bull may but if ever the sensible benedick bear it pluck off the bull's horns and set them in my forehead and let me be vilely painted and in such great letters as they write here is a good horse to hire let them signify under my sign here you may see benedick the married man benedick's self-assured declaration that he never intended to fall in love or get married and beatrice's equal scorn on the same subject put a mischievous idea into don pedro's head and it occurred to him that the week which had to elapse before the wedding might be most amusingly occupied i will warrant that the time shall not pass dully he said to leonato and claudio i will in the meantime undertake one of hercules's labors which is to bring signor benedick and the lady beatrice into a mountain of affection one for the other i would fain have it a match and i do not doubt of bringing it about if you three will but help me in the way i point out my lord i am for you though it cost me ten nights watching said leonato and i my lord said claudio i will do any modest office my lord to help my cousin to a good husband said the gentle hero and benedick is not the least hopeful husband i know said the prince thus far i can praise him he is of noble race of approved valor and of steadfast honesty i will teach you how to humor your cousin that she shall fall in love with benedick 
and i with the help of leonato and claudio will so practise on benedick that in spite of his quick wit and fastidious temper he shall fall in love with beatrice if we can do this cupid is no longer an archer his glory shall be ours for we are the only love gods come with me and i will tell you my plan a plain dealing villain now among the gentlemen in the prince of aragon's train there was one of a very different nature from claudio and benedick this was don john a half-brother of the prince and a man of sullen envious and malicious temper he was spiteful to all the world but in especial he hated his half-brother and he bore a furious grudge against the young florentine lord claudio because the latter stood high in the favor of the prince of aragon don john had long sullenly opposed his brother and had only lately been taken into favor again it now only depended on his own behavior as to whether he should go on and prosper or whether he should fall again into disgrace but don john had no intention of acting more amiably than he could possibly help his followers baracchio and conrad urged him to conceal his feelings and to bear a more cheerful countenance among the general rejoicings but don john flatly refused i had rather be a canker in a hedge than a rose in my brother's grace he said sullenly it better fits my humour to be disdained of all than to fashion a behaviour to rob love for many in this though i cannot be said to be a flattering honest man it must not be denied that i am a plain dealing villain i am trusted with a muzzle and set free with a clog therefore i have determined not to sing in my cage if i had my mouth i would bite if i had my liberty i should do my liking in the meantime let me be what i am and do not seek to alter me the news that the gallant young claudio was to wed the daughter of the governor of messina put don john into a fresh fury that young startup has all the glory of my overthrow he declared if i can cross him in any way i shall only be too delighted his two men baracchio and conrad who were as evil-natured as their master promised to help him in any scheme of vengeance he could devise and it was not long before baracchio came to him and said that he had found a way to cross count claudio's marriage any bar any cross any hindrance will do me good said don john i am sick with displeasure and whatsoever comes athwart his desire will go evenly with mine how can you cross this marriage not honestly my lord but so secretly that no dishonesty shall appear in me show me briefly how i think i told your lordship a year since how much i am in favor with margaret the waiting gentlewoman to hero i remember i can at any unseasonable instant of the night appoint her to look out at her lady's chamber window what good will that be to put an end to the marriage the poison of it lies with you to mix go to the prince your brother tell him he has wronged his honor in allowing the renowned claudio whom you must praise warmly to marry lady like hero who has already another lover what proof shall i make of that proof enough to hurt the prince to vex claudio to ruin hero and to kill leonato do you look for any other result i will do anything only to spite them go then and find a fitting hour when don pedro and count claudio are alone and tell them that you know hero loves me said the wicked baracchio they will scarcely believe this without proof offer them the opportunity to test the truth of your words bring them outside leonato's house the night before the wedding and in the meanwhile i will so fashion the matter that they shall see margaret speak to me out of the window they shall hear me call her hero and there shall appear such seeming truth of hero's disloyalty that claudio in his jealousy will feel quite assured of it and all the preparations for the wedding shall be overthrown let the issue of this be what it may i will put it in practice said don john be cunning in working this and thy fee is a thousand ducats you be steady in the accusation and my cunning shall not shame me was baracchio's response End of section 8
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by K. Hand. The Shakespeare Storybook by Mary MacLeod. Much Ado About Nothing, Part Two. Cupid's Crafty Arrow, The Night Before the Wedding. Cupid's Crafty Arrow. Benedict was strolling alone in Leonato's orchard, and as he went he mused to himself. I do wonder, he thought, that one man, seeing how much another man is a fool when he is in love, after he has laughed at such shallow follies in others, will himself become the object of his own scorn by falling in love, and such a man is Claudio. I have known when there was no music with him but the drum and the fife, and now he had rather hear the tabor and the pipe. I have known when he would have walked ten miles on foot to see a good armor, and now he will lie ten nights awake, carving the fashion of a new doublet. He was wont to speak plain and to the purpose, like an honest man and a soldier, and now his words are a very fantastical banquet, just so many strange dishes. Shall I ever be so converted, and see with those eyes? I cannot tell. I think not. I will not be sworn that love may not transform me to an oyster, but I'll take my oath on it, till he have made an oyster of me. He shall never make me such a fool. One woman is fair, yet I am well. Another is wise, yet I am well. Another virtuous, yet I am well. But till all graces be in one woman, one woman shall not come in my grace. Rich shall she be, that's certain wise and virtuous, or I'll have none of her, fair, or I'll never look on her, mild, or come not near me, noble, or not I for an angel, of good discourse, an excellent musician, and her hair, her hair shall be of what color it pleases God, ha, the prince and monsieur love, I will hide me in the arbor. And Benedick hastily concealed himself, as Don Pedro, Claudio, and Leonato approached, followed by some musicians. "'Come, shall we hear this music?' said Don Pedro, seating himself on a bench within earshot of the arbor. "'See you where Benedick has hidden himself?' he added in a low voice. "'Oh, very well, my lord,' answered Claudio. "'When the music is ended, we will give him something to think about.' "'Come, Balthasar, we'll hear that song again,' said Don Pedro." So the musicians lightly touched the strings of their instruments, and Balthazar began his song. Sigh no more, ladies, sigh no more. Men were deceivers ever. One foot in sea and one on shore, to one thing constant never. Then sigh not so, but let them go, and be you blithe and bonny, converting all your sounds of woe into hey nonny nonny sing no more ditties sing no more of dumps so dull and heavy the fraud of man was ever so since summer first was leafy then sigh not so but let them go and be you blithe and bonny converting all your sounds of woe into hey nonny nonny by my troth a good song said the prince balthasar i pray you get us some excellent music for to-morrow night we would have it at the lady hero's chamber window the best i can my lord do so farewell come hither leonato said don pedro when the young musician had retired what was it that you told me of to-day that your niece Beatrice was in love with Signor Benedick? Go on, whispered Claudio. We shall catch our bird. I did never think that lady would have loved any man, he added aloud, for Benedick's benefit. No, nor I neither, said Leonato. But it is most wonderful that she should so dote on Signor Benedick, whom she has in all outward behavior always seemed to abhor. Is it possible? Sits the wind in that corner? murmured the astonished Benedick in his hiding-place. "'By my troth, Lord, I cannot tell what to think of it, but that she loves him frantically,' continued Leonato. "'It is past the bounds of belief.' "'Has she made her affection known to Benedict?' asked Don Pedro. 
No, and she swears she never will. That is the cause of her unhappiness. "'Tis true indeed," put in Claudio. "'Shall I,' says she, "'that have so often encountered him with scorn, "'write to him that I love him?' "'I measure him by my own spirit,' she says," continued Leonato, "'for I should flout him if he wrote to me. "'Yea, though I love him, I should.' "'And then she weeps and sobs, "'beats her heart, tears her hair,' said Claudio. "'My daughter is sometimes afraid "'she will do a desperate outrage to herself,' said Leonato. It were good if Benedict knew it from someone else, if she will not reveal it," said Don Pedro. "'To what end?' asked Claudio. "'He would make but a sport of it, and torment the poor lady worse.' "'If he did, it would be a charity to hang him,' said Don Pedro indignantly. "'She is an excellent, sweet lady.' "'And she is exceedingly wise,' put in Claudio. "'In everything but in loving Benedict,' said Don Pedro. "'Oh, my lord, I am sorry for her, as I have just cause.' being her uncle and her guardian said leonato i would she had bestowed this affection on me said don pedro i would marry her at once well leonato i am sorry for your niece i pray you tell benedick of it and hear what he will say never tell him my lord said claudio let her wear out her affection with good counsel nay that's impossible said leonato she may wear her heart out first well, we will hear further of it from your daughter, said Don Pedro. I love Benedict well, and I wish he would modestly examine himself to see how much he is unworthy so good a lady. My lord, will you walk? Dinner is ready, said Leonato. If he do not dote on her after this, I will never trust my expectation, laughed Claudio, as the conspirators withdrew. Let there be the same net spread for Beatrice, said Don Pedro, and that your daughter and her gentlewomen must carry it out. The sport will be when they each believe in the other's doting, when there is no such matter. That's the scene I should like to see. Let us send her to call him in to dinner. When the others had gone, Benedict came forth from his hiding place, deeply impressed with what he had heard. Poor lady, he thought, so she really loves me. Well, her affection must be requited. I hear how I am censured. They say I will bear myself proudly if I see the love come from her. They say, too, she will rather die than give any sign of affection. I never thought to marry. I must not seem proud. Happy are those that hear their detractions and can put them to mending. They say the lady is fair. Tis a truth. I can bear them witness. And virtuous, it is so. And wise, but for loving me. But my troth, it is no addition to her wit, and no great argument of her folly, for I will be horribly in love with her. I may chance to have some odd quirks and remnants of wit broken on me, because I have railed so long against marriage. But does not a man's opinion alter? When I said I would die a bachelor, I did not think I should live till I was married. Here comes Beatrice. By this day she is a fair lady. I do spy some marks of love in her." Quite unconscious of all that had taken place, Beatrice advanced, and in her usual mocking style announced, Against my will I am sent to bid you come in to dinner. Fair Beatrice, I thank you for your pains, said Benedick. I took no more pains for those thanks than you take pains to thank me, said Beatrice carelessly. If it had been painful, I would not have come. You take pleasure, then, in the message? said Benedick eagerly. Yes, just so much as you may take upon a knife's point and choke a doll withal, laughed Beatrice. You have no appetite, Signor. Fare you well. And off she went gaily. Ha! Against my will I am sent to bid you to come in to dinner. There's a double meaning in that, thought the poor deluded Benedick. I took no more pains for those thanks than you took pains to thank me. That's as much to say any pains that I take for you is as easy as thanks. If I do not take pity on her, I am a villain. If I do not love her, I am a Jew. I will go get her picture. The same trick which Don Pedro, Claudio, and Leonato had played on Benedict was played on Beatrice by her cousin Hero and her gentlewomen, Margaret and Ursula. Beatrice was lured into the garden, and there, unseen, as she imagined by the others, she heard them discussing Benedict's love for her. They followed much the same lines as the three men had done with regard to Beatrice. They spoke of Benedict's hopeless affection, of his many good qualities, and of his fear of exciting Beatrice's scorn if he should say anything of his devotion. 
they said it was a great pity that the lady beatrice was so proud and hard-hearted and that they certainly would never tell her benedict's feelings towards her for she would only laugh at him and treat him with cruel scorn yet tell her of it hear what she will say ursula pretended to urge hero no said hero i would rather go to benedict and counsel him to fight against his passion having skilfully performed their task the ladies retired leaving beatrice overcome with wonder at what she had heard and with all her pride melting into a strange new feeling of love the night before the wedding it was not likely that benedict's changed behavior should escape notice and don pedro and claudio pretended to think he was in love and began to tease him unmercifully benedict met their raillery with an air of lofty scorn but nothing would stop the shafts of wit which the light-hearted gentleman leveled at their deluded companion and they continued to twit him on his pensive demeanor and the new air of fashion which he was adopting but all gladness and gaiety were suddenly clouded over with heavy gloom having carefully prepared his villainous plot by the aid of his follower baracchio don john came to claudio and the prince of aragon and told them what had been agreed namely that hero was unworthy to be the wife of claudio for she was already in love with baracchio and that if the prince and count claudio wished to prove the truth of his statement they had only to go that night to the street outside leonato's palace where they would see hero speaking out of a window to baracchio don pedro and claudio were of course at first stunned and incredulous but don john never faltered in the terrible lie he was relating if you follow me i will show you enough he concluded and when you have heard more and seen more proceed accordingly if i see anything to-night why i should not marry her to-morrow said claudio in the congregation where i should wed there will i shame her and as i helped you to woo her i will join with you to disgrace her said don pedro now the watchmen who kept the streets of messina were a silly set of old men whose only idea of duty was to potter about the streets and keep as far as possible out of the way of any one who was likely to give them any trouble chief of them was a constable called dogberry whose ignorance and stupidity were only equalled by his enormous self-conceit on the night before the wedding however these brilliant watchmen actually did contrive to effect a capture which led to the happiest results dogberry had finished his string of ridiculous instructions to the band and had taken his departure when two wayfarers came along from opposite directions and stopped to speak to each other these were baracchio and conrad the two followers of the wicked don john the street was quite dark and apparently deserted and as at that moment it began to drizzle with rain the two men took shelter under a convenient penthouse suspicious of some treason the watchmen concealed themselves near and thus overheard the whole tale of villainy which baracchio confessed to conrad know that i have to-night wooed margaret the lady hero's gentlewoman by the name of hero he said she leans out of the window to me she bids me a thousand times good-night but i should first tell you how the prince claudio and my master placed and instructed by my master don john saw afar off in the orchard this affectionate interview and did they think margaret was hero two of them did the prince and claudio but the devil my master knew she was margaret deceived partly by the darkness of the night but chiefly by my villainy which confirmed any slander that don john invented away went claudio enraged swore that he would meet her as was appointed next morning at the church and there before the whole congregation shame her with what he had seen and send her home again without a husband baracchio had scarcely finished speaking when the watchman pounced on the two villains surprised by the suddenness of the onslaught they were quickly overpowered and finding any attempt at resistance useless they had to submit to being led ignominiously away end of section nine